KICILP 105.3 FM is Iowa City's nonprofit local radio station. We rely on listener support, and you can help us continue to air great programming like Democracy Now!, Great Taste, Green Room IC, The Situation Room, and This Way Out by making a one-time donation or setting up a recurring donation at our website, KICIRadio.org. Just click on the Donate button and become part of the team. KICILP, low power, high impact. Coming up on The Green Room I See, Beverly Mead interviewed people from Iowa City Community Theater's production of The Pillow Man. We welcomed Mary Christensen, Nick Kilberg, Jennifer Smith, and Brian Tanner to KICI's Green Room I See. This interview was recorded using Zoom on February 23, 2023. I initially got involved in community theater as a way basically just to keep myself from getting in trouble just constantly as a child. If you read any of the original Hans Christian Andersen's type stuff or Brothers Grimm, they're very different from the the Disney versions that you might see. Katurian is an author. He's written 400 stories and he works in a slaughterhouse. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to The Green Room I See. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Brian Tanner, director, and Mary Christensen, stage manager of Iowa City Community Theater's upcoming production of The Pillow Man, as well as cast members, James McIntyre as Katurian, Nick Kilberg as Tupolsky, Jennifer Smith as Ariel, Welcome. It's great to have you here. Our audience members always like to know who's behind the mic. Could you each please tell us, our listeners, a little bit about yourselves, such as your background in theater, where you come from, etc.? Brian, let's start with you. Certainly. I'm Brian Tanner, I'm currently the director of The Pillow Man, and I've been involved in community theater for a little over 20 years now, a um, little bit of a, a late start on my end. Um, I was always interested in, in it in uh, you know, school and, and such, but didn't really um, try out for anything until I was uh, a little bit older and uh, saw a production at Iowa City Community Theater. And I was like, you know, this seems kind of fun. I might want to try and do this. So I auditioned for a couple of things, got cast and the rest is history, I guess. We're very happy to have you with us. Mary, would you like to chime in here? About a late start, um, I started about 20 weeks ago in community theater. Um, now, okay. I did a lot of stuff in high school. Um, you know, I was involved in speech and any drama production, community or school. You know, I was in, in it somehow. I was involved in it somehow. But then I never really knew how to get involved in um, local theater or anything um, until one of my coworkers at the university uh, mentioned being involved. And so I sort of um, started getting to know people who are into local theater uh, that way. So when Brian asked me to uh, stage manage, I was absolutely thrilled. Um, but it's my first time stage managing. I've done assistant stage management, but not. Yeah. Ah, we will get you in the fun way then, won't we? It's been great. Yeah. So Mary, are you, oh, I love your kitty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mine may crawl through here once in a while too. Uh, Mary, are you from Iowa City originally? Oh, um, so I grew up in Central Iowa, um, Adel, but uh, then I, I spent good six years out of the country actually, teaching in Japan. Um, oh. Yeah, and then I came back here, got my master's, um, taught at the university for some time. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome back. Thanks. All right, let's see here. Let's go with James. And do you okay. prefer James or Jim? I like James. James is fine. That's um, That was my uh, preference to start with, but go ahead and tell us about you. Great, and thanks for having me. Um, my so friend. my name is James McIntyre. I'm originally from the Central Valley in California. 
Um, I initially got involved in community theater as a way basically just to keep myself from getting in trouble just constantly as a child. <laughs> um, so that was a good way to sort of keep my hands busy. Um, and it eventually just turned into a lifelong passion of mine. I've been in something like 40 something plays, uh, two Very professional good. directed, uh, I think four now. Um, and I moved here um, in 2019, I believe it was, um, to go to the University of Iowa, where I received my master's degree in biochemistry. And now I'm continuing working with um, the university um, in their clinical trials department and doing theater as much as I can, as often as I can. All right. Very good. Well, we're glad to have you here. Jennifer, it's your turn. Who are you? All right. Here we go. I'm Jennifer Smith and I am from Cedar Rapids. I got started in theater, I want to say seven or eight years ago, actually, my very first play, Brian Tanner wrote in excellent. In, yeah, in a 24 hour play festival for Rich Heritage Theater in Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I got started is because my son wanted to do it, but he couldn't find any of his friends that wanted to do it with him. And I thought, you know, I've always wanted to try theater. It looks fun. You, it's it's only going to take up a weekend of my time. Let's try it. And uh, I was put in Brian's group and I absolutely fell in love with it. It was only a 10 minute play, but I thought to myself, I need to do more of this. And Very so good. that's how I got started in theater. Well, you got a great person to write your show for you. What was the name of the show? Was it Kid President? No, it was, um, let's make uh, Washington Elementary School great again. That's right. Ah, and it was, a, it was a satire of uh, I, yeah. a certain administration. So. Yes, and I played the reporter on that. And yeah, it was yeah. just, it was so much fun. All right, very good. And Nick, not the least, but the last. That's fair. Yeah, my name is Nick Kilberg, and I'm originally from Cedar Rapids. I did undergraduate uh, in Minnesota, and then I came back to Iowa City for law school. And I've been in the Iowa City or Cedar Rapids areas since. Uh, I had the opportunity to do a lot of theater when I was in high school, a little less in college, and I've kind of dipped my toe into the waters occasionally since. I've been in shows with Theater Cedar Rapids, Dreamwell, uh, and one or two others uh, around there. I know that I was in one of the underground shows, uh, TCR, with Jennifer a few years ago. And then my most recent appearance on stage was actually in a show directed by James. It was a one act with run of the mill theaters. And it's been a pleasure getting to work with everyone again and Brian and Mary for the first time. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, Brian, what was it about this play, The Pillow Man, that drew you to it and made you want to direct it? Um, yeah, I, I had actually seen this a number of years ago um, when Dreamwell did it. Uh, I want to say like about 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it was done in the area. And then an, a small group in, in Cedar Rapids also performed it about the same time. And I saw it up there. And it, it's uh, there's, there's a lot of layers to this show. And I guess it just I just kind of found it sort of haunting me uh, is the term I kind of use mm -hmm. um, because yeah, there's a lot going on in, in there that, um, you know, first face value, you know, there's there's some shock value to it, but it's more than that. You, you're talking about um, life imitating art, imitating life, that kind of cycle, the cycle of uh, trauma that may influence decisions and um, artistry. Those are just a couple of the, the big ones. You, there's just, there's also the discussion of what it means to be an artist. Um, what is your legacy? Um, is it you? Is it your product? It, what lives on after you're gone? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot to unpack, so to speak. So, there are shows that pull at your mind and pull at your mm -hmm. heart, and I've got one that I may never ever get a chance to direct, mm -hmm. but it's there. Mm -hmm. Well, could you give us a brief overview of the storyline for those who are not familiar with it? Sure. The, um, the the gist of it is that a writer in a totalitarian uh, dictatorship has been brought in for questioning because there's been some crimes committed that reflect 
uh, some of his unpublished stories that he's written. Uh, so he's a key person of interest. And, and so it's that interaction between um, the officers, the detectives that are interrogating him, um, and also some um, uh, touches on the relationship between himself and his brother. And so, yeah, so that's the gist of it. He writes something like, um, I would, I just kind of refer to it as like a modern Grimm's fairy tale. Um, okay. So more kind of like updated, you know, where um, there's some, maybe there's some lessons to be learned. Maybe it's just kind of a creepy story. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, definitely. If you read any of the original Hans Christian Andersen's type stuff or Brothers Grimm, they're very different from the, the Disney versions that you might see sure. <laughs> so sure. um so there are those aspects and um in the the crimes that have been committed have been uh, particularly brutal and um so they are definitely um of the mindset of trying to find out who's who's done these crimes okay now while we have three of the actors here with us today how many people are in the cast altogether there are seven altogether. There, there's okay. four uh, main roles. There's Katerian, who is the writer, uh, Tupolsky and Ariel, that are the uh, detectives, uh, Mikhail, the brother. And then there are some um, people that um, act out the stories um, that are told, some of them. We're using, a, a, and I can talk about this later, but we, um, we use a variety of storytelling methods. And uh, one of the main ones is to act out the stories. So we have uh, Ken Van Egden, Elizabeth Ross, and Ruby wow. Murray um, acting out these stories. Um, Very good. Yeah. And so they'll be on and off, as it were, um, as he goes through goes through them. Okay. Well, as a first-time stage manager, Mary, were there any real difficulties in wrangling this many people? Well, it's not that many. Um I mean, considering, so I was ass assistant stage managing with um, Rent, and okay. that's a massive cast, loads of moving parts. Um, we've got microphones, got a lot more, well, more set pieces, but certainly more actors, more movement back and forth all the time. Sure, sure. Um, now, here we've got a small core group, um, but everyone involved is pretty experienced. So I'm, I'm kind of letting um, Brian guide that process. And um, as, trying to work with everyone just to like feel out, okay, what part of me being helpful is being helpful, what part's being distracting, um, and just adapting as I go. And um, it's actually a really good smaller production to uh, kind of learn that skill set on. Okay, very good. So yeah, Mary's been uh, very, if I can uh, kind of toot Mary's horn here a little bit, she's been a great um, asset for the, the production and um, you know, she's right in line with what I, my vision for the show. Um, she, you know, she helps uh, pick up things where I leave off, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, she's uh, definitely great to work with. And I certainly recommend her highly for future productions. And um, if anybody's looking to hire a great um, writer or editor, that kind of thing, uh, I believe that she would be um, willing to uh, hear any offers. The, the other right. thing I'm doing a lot is work, looking for a job. So <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, I'm right. a full time line. I've got some side stuff, but. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> James, you. Nick, and Jennifer, could you each please give our listeners an overview of your characters? Let's start with Nick this time. Sure. I play Detective Topolsky, who I think is the more senior of the two detectives between uh, Topolsky and Ariel, Jennifer's character. And Brian mentioned earlier that this, uh, one of the themes of this play is kind of how different people process trauma. And I think that's really reflected in every single uh, word, every single line in this play. Uh, everybody's dealing with their own past and, and how that's uh, influenced them. And, and Topolsky is really an example of that because there are just a few cracks in the facade that he tries to put up of himself uh, as a person who's in control, who's all powerful, uh, that suggests that there's more going on beneath the surface than he wants to admit or even can admit to himself. And that's what has really made this an interesting process to try to dive in and see what makes him tick. All right, very good. Jennifer, how about you? 
So yes, I play Detective Ariel, and to go off what Nick said, um, yes, he is also dealing with his uh, type of trauma. And the thing that I find interesting about Ariel is that you find out very quickly, maybe not find out, but label him very quickly um, in the first act as this type of police officer. But then you also find out what type of trauma that he has been dealing with and what he brings to the table in his job. And the one thing that I've always found interesting about this part is that it's very, it uses up a lot of emotional energy. I noticed that when I get inside of Ariel's head because of his trauma, I'm constantly, you know, clenching my jaw or always angry or something like that, that I have to decompress after rehearsal. And so mm -hmm. I just like that Ariel is just more than what he seems. I don't condone what he does, but you can certainly see why he acts that way. And he admits that he's not perfect. Like Topolsky, he wants to be perfect. He wants to be right all the time. He has to be right. He's the boss. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good match with Ariel because he admits that he's wrong, but he knows that he's wrong and he likes doing it the way he does because of just the stances that he has so right yeah. okay james tell us about you sure so Katur yes uh katorian is um a an author um he's written 400 stories and he works in a slaughterhouse only one of his stories has ever been published um and since he is working in a slaughterhouse and he has had um such a he's also had a traumatic childhood much like all of the other characters in this play he is basically inundated with with violence and suffering pretty much his whole life and he has um i believe a sort of a split uh opinion on what that suffering has done for him as an author um, this one of the things that I really like about Katurian is how internally inconsistent he is, because I think uh, he believes that his suffering um, as a, a child and um, just in his current life has contributed to him becoming a good author, whether or not his stories have been published in a million different publications or not, he still has a high opinion of himself, but he also, um, the, the titular um, story of the pillow man is a parable about how suffering it's it's sometimes very desirable to avoid it even if it costs you know the ultimate price and so he has these two different strings pulling at his head at all times about you know did my suffering really make me a great artist um and was it all worth it and it also, um, there's also a great character study about Katurian in that um, uh, I think the play is asking the audience, what do you really think about um, why Katurian was able to write such horrifying stories, these, these gripping sort of yeah. sickening narratives? Is it because, you know, he is... A, uh, a bad person, a pervert, a monster, or does it have something to do with his upbringing, with the violence that he's gone through and experienced? Or do you accept Katurian's framing in the story to say, it doesn't say anything about me at all. They're just, they're just stories, right? He, they're just stories. Um, and so I think he's a really interesting, uh, contrasting character um, while having a lot in common with all the other characters in the play as well. Well, listening to you each describe your characters, I'm thinking, no pun intended, every pun intended, I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of thought-provoking instances where people are going to have to really sit down and think about what is being said and done on the stage, which I love. I love having a show that's going to make me think or feel or both. So, Brian... Based on the names of the characters, these three characters at least, it does not sound like this is an, a show in America. <laughs> Where have you placed it? And are you asking the actors to do any accent? Um, well, it's an interesting thing because in the script, it's, it's fairly nondescript and it almost seems to be sort of a melting pot of um various locations like 
you know, certain things sound British, certain things sound maybe um, European. Um, so it, I think it was intentionally done to not necessarily um, nail down a specific regime or um, a government or anything. Um, so yeah, but the names do lend themselves to um, lend themselves to that. Um, as far as accents, the the playwright uh, Martin McDonough is uh, an Irish playwright, and um, you know there was a time early on pre-production that I had considered accents, but um, you know mainly it was just a matter of um, just using our natural voices um, and not you know trying to force anything. Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, there's there's certainly some slang, but even the slang kind of um, bridges different cultures. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's you know they say you know bloody this, which is you know of course kind right. of British, but there's other things that sound more Irish. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's not really any specific place. Um, it's not even really a particular time, although we sort of feel like it's around this time. Um, originally, it was written uh, performed back in 2003. Um, so it's got a good 20 years on it. Okay. Um, by the way, if the name sounds familiar, um, he's done the, uh, Martin McDonough's done a, a bit of film work as well. Um, you might be familiar with uh, In Bruges, uh, Seven Psychopaths, Three Billboards Outside uh, Ebbing, Missouri, Missouri, mm -hmm. yeah. And which he won best uh, screenplay for uh, a couple of year or two ago. And then uh, most recently, The Banshees of Inisherin which is up for um, best original screenplay uh, right. this, this right. Oscar season, which having seen it, I, I suspect that it's a pretty good contender for that um, that award. So. Okay. Because of the ongoing pandemic, and yes, I said that intentionally, theaters have been encountering many difficulties. While things have eased recently, what have you been doing to keep your cast and crew safe? Yeah, it, it's so, you know, things have been relaxed and, you know, we're trying to follow, you know, the CDC guidelines as best we can. Um, we did have a, a, um, a moment, you know, where we did have to isolate for about a week. And, you know, fortunately with the, um, with the pandemic, we, you know, there's been a lot of work with Zoom and Skype and stuff. So we did have some Zoom rehearsals okay. um, where we kept people separated. And I think that um, helped uh, quite a bit. Um, be, I think we minimized um, the exposure and, um, and and keeping it from spreading. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag because it's relaxed, but it's also you're also still cautious too. So very um, good, yeah. very good. Well, with with regard to that, are masks in the audience going to be required during the performances? Um, that I believe is up to the, the theater. Um, I think they're encouraged at this point. Um, um, they may want to, uh, people may want to check the website, but um, I do believe that the, uh, or actually Nick is on the board, you might be able to speak to it um, better, but I know they have masks on hand. So if it is required and you don't have one, uh, they should have some available. So. Nick, can you speak to that please? Yeah, yeah. To leap in there, I am a, a member of the board of Iowa City Community Theater, and our current policy is based on what the community exposure level is. If it's medium or below, masks are encouraged, and they are provided there for you at the show if you need one. And it really is a, if you want one, come get it, no questions asked. If it's high, we do request that uh, audience members uh, plan to wear one to the theater, or again, use one of the ones that we have on hand. So we okay. want to be safe and also encourage people to use their own best judgment for their circumstances. Okay. What are the run dates, including curtain times for each performance? Right, they're um, 7.30 Fridays and Saturdays and 2 p.m. on Sundays and opens March 3rd. Um, so March 3rd, 4th and 5th. And then uh, second weekend is March 10th, 11th and 12th. Very good. Mary, where is the show being produced? It, what, what are we asking here? <laughs> where is it going to be? Where are people going to come to see the show? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, it's uh, it's at the um, Iowa City Community Theater Barn, which okay. is um, at Johnson County Fairgrounds. And um, could you remind me which building that is? Is it? It's Exhibition is it? Hall A. Exhibition Hall A. Thank you. Yeah. 
And there's also a sign out there that will tell you it's the theater. We appreciate that, yeah. Okay. All right. For those audience members who are like me, it's important to know, is ICCT handicap accessible? Brian? Yes, it is. Okay. Very good. Yep, there's uh, one level and uh, yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. How would you rate this show if you need to with regard to how appropriate it would be for younger viewers, say 13 and under? I, it, uh, well, I always uh, answer something like that with um, the parentals, you know, the parents unit's uh, best judgment. Um, I, if this were um, being rated by the MPAA for a movie, it would be a hard R, um, mainly for language, um, thematic material. Um, yeah, it's, it, there's some, uh, not just the um, continual use of F-bombs, but um, also some slurs involved too, so. Um, and so just, if, the parents, if parents have a question, is there a way they can contact you? Uh, sure. Uh, they could um, email me at tannermojo at gmail.com. Okay. All right. Let's see. How would someone go about purchasing tickets for the show? I believe they can go through the website. And uh, I believe that's Iowa Community Theater. I, I'm sorry, Iowa City Community Theater.org. Mm -hmm. And that's theater with an R-E. We are pretentious <laughs> that way, as uh, Josh Sazan always likes to say. <laughs> yes. Um, many people need to coordinate their schedules with regard to babysitters, dinner, transportation, et cetera. To help them in this regard, Mary, about how long does this show run? Um, so we are planning on doing a couple of intermissions because it is a bit of a longer one. Um, mm -hmm. Act one, now, Brian, remind me if this is wrong. Act one runs about... An hour? Yeah, an hour, a little less, maybe. A little more like 50 minutes. Act yeah. two, around 40, and then act three, another 40-ish? Um, okay. Act two is closer to an hour, yeah. So okay. I, I, I'd say with intermissions, it's going to be a ballpark of three hours. Yeah, yeah, it is hours. a bit of a longer one, as I said, yeah. People like to know that. That's very yeah. good. Okay, again, The Pillow Man, produced by Iowa City Community Theater, is being performed Oh, my happy heart. Live and in person on Fridays and Saturdays, March 3rd, 4th, 10th, and 11th at 7.30 p.m. And Sundays, March 5th and 12th at 2 p.m. Well, it's time to close the curtain on this interview. Thank you again for being here today. It's been so much fun and very informative, and I've really enjoyed our time together. I hope we can do another interview with you all again soon. Thanks for okay, Thank you. Thank you so much. The Green Room IC is an original production of KICI Radio in Iowa City. The host for this episode is Beverly Mead, with production by Craig Jarvie. Visit KICI's SoundCloud page to hear this and other Green Room IC interviews.